Hey, welcome back to the, the Wednesday night Bible study. Last time we met, we we just got finished up with the minor prophets, and this week we're going to choose a book from the from the New Testament. We're going to work in the book of Mark, one of the four Gospels. And the, during this next several weeks, we will be covering the book of Mark, but then we'll continue through the rest of the Gospels. But it's really amazing, though, about the Gospels and how they were all. Um, it's interesting, when you put them all together, they were there to create a greater, more complete picture of what had happened and uh, when Jesus walked the, his earthly ministry. You know, so when, you, when you look at all the different writers, you can see that the different gospel writers tend to give a different emphasis on what they've seen. And here, we, as we start the book of Mark uh, this evening, we'll do a little bit of an intro. Uh, Mark was more of a straightforward, uh, he was quick, he gives us kind of the reader digest of things. He focuses on Jesus, the servant, the worker. Uh, he focused on the deeds of Jesus and the things he had done. Uh, Mark was not one of the 12 disciples, but Mark was very much involved in the early church and was a young boy even at the time when Jesus had his earthly ministry. Uh, Mark's mother uh, was a wealthy woman that, that we know of that she opened her home for the early church in Jerusalem. Um, the early church tradition suggests that Mark was that certain young man who followed Christ right up to his entry into the house of the high priest when Christ was taken away. Uh, Mark was also known as John Mark, who hung around with Paul and Barnabas. Uh, John Mark was one of the ones who left Paul while in, on his missionary journey, or we call it an outreach, um, that upset Paul because later we see that there was an argument between Paul and Barnabas about taking John Mark back on the next, next uh, missionary journey, uh, what would happen is that uh, Mark would go with, or John Mark would go with Barnabas because Barnabas was his uncle and Paul would have taken Silas as a, his next companion, next uh, student or mentor. Uh, Peter called John Mark his son in 1 Peter 5.13 as a in reference of a spiritual son. Uh, John Mark became, an, became important later in Apostle Paul's life and in his ministry. So there must have been a time where they made up. There was a, something that happened, uh, maybe a maturing in, in John Mark and a softening of an Apostle Paul. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, Paul, uh, John Mark became a kind of an assistant, though, to, to the Apostle Peter. Uh, and some believe that the gospel here that Mark, that we're about to read and get into uh, and study, was written uh, by John Mark, but were really uh, the Apostle Peter's eyewitness testimonies and his words. Uh, remember, John Mark was just a young boy during the ministry of Jesus. I'm not saying he didn't throw something in there on his own, but that's what a lot of people that I've kind of talked to and some of the things I've studied, that that's a lot of belief in that. So let's just get into the, the, the book of Mark tonight. Uh, we're going to be in the ESV. I'll be coming out of ESV. So what, whatever translation you use that you understand more, um, it, it, it's good to you. You know, it's all right to use. But let's pray real quick. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you, Lord, for the Gospels. I thank you, Lord, for what was written down for us to glean off of and, and, and see, Lord. And, and Lord, I thank you for the writers. And I, and, I, and I ask tonight, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would breathe on each of us today as we read your word and as we study the word. But Lord, as we go back after this, even after this, this lesson is done today, Lord, as we go back, Lord, refresh our mind. But Lord, also show us some things that we may have not covered. And Father, we just ask your Spirit would just breathe into us tonight. And Lord, let our minds be open and our hearts Lord, be like sponges tonight to hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, let's go to the book of Mark, chapter 1. Right off in the first verse, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's interesting, the gospel means just means good news. And you know, even when we read these 16 chapters, and as we read the other chapters, they are the only really good news, the eternal news that to this world that the world has that gives us eternal life, that the good news that Christ did, that his life, his death, and his resurrection, Lord, and and what Christ had did. Think about this, though. If you take away everything that Jesus had done, his life, his death, and his resurrection, what do we really have left? Do we have any kind of hope? It's almost like you get that old saying uh, uh, they used to say in the old days, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die. You know, the world tells us to we need to be happy, but you know what? We can never find meaning in life. The only way we can find meaning in life is through the Word of God and through Jesus Christ and what He has done. Because there is no happiness without Jesus. And, you know, I can't imagine my life without, without the gospel, without, the, without life, without the good news of what Jesus did. That He came 
to rescue each of us from eternity away from God. And the good news tells us that I can have life and I can have it abundantly through Christ as, as Lord and Savior. Verse 2 and 3 going says, As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send a messenger before your face and who will prepare your way. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Here we see that Mark is quoting from Malachi 3 and also from Isaiah 40, verses 1 and 3. So if you want to turn to Isaiah verses, or chapter 40, verse 1 and 3. Talk says comfort for God's people. I'm just going to read the first three verses. It goes on. It says comfort, comfort my people. Says your God, speak tenderly to Jerusalem and, and cry to her, that her warfare is ended and that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice, remember, a voice who cries, a voice in the wilderness prepares the way of the Lord, makes straight in the desert a highway for our God. You know, great biblical prophecy can be seen um, can be seen here to first Jesus' first coming and then Jesus' second coming. Remember, I talked about it a little bit in the in when we just got through the minor prophets that uh, there's sometimes there's prophecies there's dual fulfillment. You know, it means you know something for then and then something for for later for a later purpose. This is one of those one of those right here, and Mark is bringing out the point that there would be one coming to prepare the way, and we know it to be. John the Baptist. From from both of those scriptures, there's a great reference for it to be John the Baptist. So let's go to verse 4 and 5. It says, Now John appeared baptizing in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And in all the country, and it's interesting to say all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. You have to admit, though, this is a huge cry, or a huge cry, but it's also a huge move of God to get the crowd of people to confess their sins. Come on, it's, let's just be honest. It's a challenge to fill churches today with people. You know, we can fill we can fill a sports stadium to watch a sporting event, whether it's soccer, football, baseball, whatever your sport your sport is. But to have a crowd of people repent, I mean, they're talking a lot of people coming. But seriously, we see that God moves on the heart of people to repent. Imagine people. T talking about their sin, and then they're talking about the importance of repenting of it. We, we don't see a lot of that nowadays. We don't see a lot of people talking about repenting. We don't talk a lot of people about the importance of their sin or even mourning over their sins. Listen, people don't like looking at their own sin. They don't like looking at themselves. They like pointing the finger, but they don't like looking at their own sins. And Mark tells us the people of Judea and Jerusalem came to repent. Imagine a city. Imagine if our country. Just see, let's look at our community, our borough, our township. Imagine all the people just coming together and truly repenting and turning their ways, their from their from their ways and going on to God's ways. See, when we think of repent, we think of an you know, I don't know about you, but when I worked in a city, you think about when the words repent comes out, I think about an old, crazy old looking person walking around a city with a sign, maybe maybe a sign on the front, maybe a sign on the back, maybe they were holding a sign up in the air you know, while on the streets yelling, Repent, for the kingdom of God is here, or repent of your sins, your time is near. I don't know if you can kind of reference that in your own mind. I remember a lot of times growing up, whenever I worked in the city, when I worked in the, in the unions, I'd go down to the city of Pittsburgh, and there'd be a guy in a milk crate standing there, dressed really nice. <laughs> he had this big sign, Repent of your sins, repent of your sins. And most people would look at this guy like he was a whack job. He was loony, you know. And, but the guy was really sharing his heart. It was the way he expressed his faith. He said, listen, this is what I believe. You know, maybe he had a, he had a, a, a phenomenal, maybe he had a radical change. Maybe he was, his life was one of great sin, and he felt that, you know what, God really, uh, God really healed me and help, helped me, and I want to really tell the people how I really feel. Um, but, you know, sometimes we think that way. But how does it re how is it received to other people? I personally, when I'd seen it, I thought he was crazy. I thought he was a little bit off. But repent, to me, in my own words, just basically means, listen, you're turning 180 degrees. You're facing one way, which way is you're facing your own way. And when you repent, you're turning 100% or 180% around, and you're, and you're facing God. You're turning from the direction you were going, and you're changing your course. You're changing the way you think, your mind. You're changing your actions, and you're turning to God in humility 
and ask him, forgive me. See, this was a great, huge move of God back then. You know, but you have to ask yourself this. How does repentance prepare the way for the Messiah to come so that you can hear him? So let's flip over to the, the book of Luke real quick. We're going to go to Luke chapter 7. Just going to pick a couple verses, uh, verses 28, 29, and 30. It says, I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet, the one who is the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. We'll come back to that in another discussion. When all the people heard this, the tax collectors, now they were probably like, they were considered probably like the gum that was at the bottom of your shoe as you walked down the street. They weren't very looked highly upon. They weren't, they really weren't. Kind of like lawyers and car salesmen of the day, but that's not a, a rip on car salesmen and lawyers, just to be honest with you. Uh, they declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, having not been baptized then. That's incredible insight, though, into repentance, that the power of repentance and what it can do in each of our lives. It opens our hearts to hear from God. Listen, those the religious people didn't want to hear it. They didn't hear it. Their hearts were so hard. Here, here Jesus comes on and says, listen, here it is. Or John actually says it first, and we're going to have to catch Jesus in a minute. Repent. Repent. Turn from your ways. You know, people who have soft hearts know that their hearts are not always right and always good. But they were ready for a change, and God was going to about to give it to them. A, a heart that does not repent won't hear God. That's a sad part about it. You know, I can remember, like I said, I gave my heart to the Jesus. I can remember that day that when, when that man made that altar call. You know, I put my hands up several times and didn't see him. I was arguing with God about it, but my heart was tender. I was like, dude, I want, I, I want my life, my life, I want my life to change. I knew when, when, I knew when I gave my heart, when I, when I said that sinner's prayer, I knew that I was not in a good place. I wasn't really bad. I wasn't, you know, tearing up cities. But I knew that I had, I, there was sin in my life. I knew I was a, a sinful man. And it was so refreshing, so cool to, when, when I gave my heart to Jesus that it was just like, boom. He said, man, I love you. He says, we're going to work through some things. He says, we got a journey together. You know, and, and, and that, just even hearing God's voice then, because my heart was prepared, changed my life. There's only been a, I, there's only been a few times in my life that I've heard God's voice audibly. A lot of times I heard through the Spirit, through my heart, through His Word, through other people, through prophecy, through dreams. But there's there's nothing beats when you hear God's audible voice. To something that I want to share from you in my heart. Let's go to verse six. It says, "Now John was clothed in camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey." Now, when you think about this. I don't know if I could really don a locust. I mean, I've eaten chocolate-covered ants and, you know, once in a while running around or driving around in a convertible, had my mouth open, a bug flew done. That was about it. But I don't know if I could eat locusts as a, a supplement for my meal. But um, they were considered, I guess, considered to be uh, a clean bug from God's laws. Uh, wild honey from wild bees, not sure why that's emphasis as wild honey and just not saying honey. I'm not sure, but it sticks out in my mind, but I never really met a tame bee. Um, I don't think they beekeepers back in. They could have. I, I don't know, but I never met a tame bee. But it says Elijah wore much the same outfit as John the Baptist did, that John the Baptist did years later. You know what I mean? Uh, Elijah, you know, did God... It's one thing, though, when you look at Elijah's life, God worked many miracles to him, and then as the mantle was passed on to Elisha, we see that, you know, he got the double portion. But we never really see, did, did John the Baptist ever, uh, did God ever do a miracle through John the Baptist? I, I don't, you know, did he ever heal somebody? Did he ever, you know, or is, we don't know. Uh, I don't, you know, getting all those people together and baptizing to me would be a miracle. But we know, we know that was the hand of the Lord doing that. But um, I look at John the Baptist as considered one of the last Old Testament prophets because the Holy Spirit had not rested yet on, inside of man. Uh, John preached remission of sins, change your hearts and turn to Christ. That was that's what he did. And what was interesting in verse seven it says, and he preached saying, After me comes one who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. Now, to you and me, this statement may seem a little we can't really relate to what he's talking about here, but 
Uh, people back then uh, understood what John was saying. To the Jew, uh, the Jews, to, to the Jew, this elevated Jesus and humbled John. Now, uh, where I read some of my in my own studies, uh, the teachers of Judaism used to say a teacher could and would ask anything of his student except to help him take off his shoes. That would be kind of like a beneath um, beneath the student to do. To ask someone to loosen your sandals was to was really looked down upon. Um, now John is coming around saying, I am not worthy to take off his sandals. So you, <laughs> you think about how, how, how does that really make John look? See, the religious leader said, uh, you're better than that. Don't, don't help others with their shoes. It's kind of like looking down upon. But then John says, I'm not really worthy to take, take off his shoes. I'm not worthy. Meaning if the teachers are saying it's, it's really something low to do, then John's saying, listen, I'm not even worthy to do that. That's how low, I mean, John thought. Because he says, I came, in verse 8, he says, I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm interesting thinking about this here now. There's a three, there's a three-letter conjunction there, the word, but. It is sure there's a contrast of the two different baptisms, baptisms mentioned here. It's important we understand this. The word baptize means to immerse, means, you, you know, when you, when you go swimming, you dive off your diving board, or you jump into the water, you go under the water, that's basically immersion. That's just totally covered over. Now, John John does water. Jesus does Holy Spirit. Now, listen, water will go away. You'll get wet. You will dry. It is a preparation for what Jesus will give you. It gives you the basic ideas. It gives your mind the time to spin and think. Okay, John's dumping me in water. It's a proclamation of my that I want to serve Jesus. It's for proclamation as I'm a follower of Jesus. Okay. Now, when we think about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's an immersion of God. It's the Holy Spirit of God. It's kind of, it really kind of blows your mind. It probably blew your mind back then too. But listen, you're being immersed in the Holy Spirit. That means you're going to be covered. You're going to be Inside and out, you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Water baptism will not save you. Water baptism will not transform you. The Holy Spirit will do both. There's a big difference. I know many people that have, gotten, have gotten water baptized three and four times. And they're like, well, you know, my test, my testimony was ruined after my first one and second one. And, and you can tell us, listen, no matter how many times you water baptize, that's great. If you want to do it again and you're going to tell people, hey, look, I'm going to change my life again. You're going to need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You're going to have to be filled with the Spirit because he's the only one that can transform your life and seal your faith, your, seal you for eternal life. Having God's Spirit with you, living in you, empowering you to do what He's called you to do and what He's asked you to do. So you can get ground, you can get drowned in water, but that will never change the condition of your heart. But drowning yourself in God's Holy Spirit will. When you allow the Spirit of God to change you, to transform you, when you're willing to humble yourself and say, I got some areas in my life that's bad. I need this to be fixed. And trusting in faith that God will do it. There's a major under, a major difference. And I need you to understand this. Water baptism will not save you. It won't transform you. But the Holy Spirit will. Amen. And belief in Christ. There's resurrection. Death and resurrection. And the power of the Holy Spirit. And receiving God's Holy Spirit. Receiving God's uh, gift of eternal life. Receiving Jesus Lord and Savior. Brings you to... To a place of having eternal life. Meaning you're saved. You're born again. But understand that. You know, a lot of people think. Well water, you, water baptism, baptism is a necessity. Well. We'll get into this a little bit about that. Uh, I think about the man on the cross. The, the, you know, it never says he was water baptized. Some say he was. Some say he wasn't. But it never says he was. He says we remember me in your kingdom. There was a heart transformation. And Jesus says, today you were with me in paradise. Uh, verse 9. 
through 11. It says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and his spirit descending on him like a dove. Can you imagine that time? A voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son with who you I am well pleased. How many of us want to hear those words from God? I am well pleased. I think any father or any son, any child would want to hear that from their father. There's been a lot of times in my life where my dad would just come up and say, I'm pleased with you. Hey, good job. I'm happy. And I remember that time when he used to do that to me. It was like, boy, if my attitude was bad, it was good after that. You know, and I can imagine what was going on. You know, we see that even now Mark has kind of an economy of words. <laughs> it's almost like a low budget. He doesn't tell us a lot about the conversation between John and Jesus. Uh, the baptism of Jesus, to me, and maybe to you, if you think about when you read this, um, it can be an enigma for us. Now, John's baptism one was one for us to repent of our sins. Now, think about this. Why did Jesus get water baptized? Think about it. Was it out of obedience? Why? He was sinless. Why did Jesus get baptized by John the Baptist? Was he shown a message? Was he shown kind of the criteria? What was he trying to say? Jesus was without sin. Why would Jesus get into the water about waist high to be baptized? You know, for me, I think there was probably other people being baptized at the same time. You know, I think maybe there didn't say, but maybe, you know, how do we know there wasn't a couple other people up there, you know, dunking people in the water who were maybe followers of John doing what John had asked? We don't know. Um, but we've seen a lot of times, we've seen the movies on TV, we see John the Baptist, and we see the, the, the whole the whole thing, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit coming down. But I think about this. When others are being baptized, maybe there was others all around, up and down the river, however it was, Jesus walks into the water, surrounded by sinners. Now, mind you, a bunch of other sinners, there's people lining up. I think this is a picture where Jesus conveying to us about baptism that about that day. It wasn't about baptism that day. It was about an identification. Jesus came in the midst of the Jordan, surrounded by sinners, and said, I am among you. I'm here to represent you. I identify with you, not with your sin, because he was sinless and perfect. I identify in what I came to do with your sin on the cross. I came to deal with it. I think he came to represent us in judgment by taking on our sins. He became sin. I think he was saying, I am here to take all away your sins. I think, I think when Jesus came into the water, it could have been out of obedience. But I think when he went in, I think it was a process of identifying I was fully God, fully man. I think when Jesus came up out of the water, we see the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I think it was a beautiful picture. Whom God says, I am well pleased. I think about, you know, that Jesus came, uh, when, he, when he came down, you know, you, and you think about this, why did he have to get water baptized? I think he was just saying, here I am. I am here to and, and I identify. I want you to see who I am. I am the great I am. I am the fulfilling of the word. I am the fulfilling of the prophecy. I came to, so that you would, that you will have freedom. You know, as 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 even as we, we, we talk about this, we can get to a place where we can study this on our own and we can find more out. But for me, it was Jesus' identification. Hey, here I am. I identify with you guys. I'm gonna I'm gonna take away your sins. I'm gonna give you life. I'm gonna give the opportunity for eternal life. But you have to prepare your hearts, you have to surrender, you have to repent, you have to turn. I can imagine all these people that were there when Jesus was being baptized, when Jesus came up by the water and the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost was sitting there. And, and, and you see all these other people seeing Jesus and they're saying, this is the Son of God. Look at him. You, I mean, you hear the voices. You, 
you see the dove coming. Because you remember, the dove came in the, in, in the Old Testament, but he never stayed on those people. He was only there for a season or for a certain mission. And here we see that he rested on, on, on Jesus. Because it says right there, after, they, after he came up out of the water, I'm sure he, dry, he probably dried off. And it says in verse 12 and 13, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. We, you know, think about that. The Spirit drove him out immediately. Not just like two days later, three days later. And it says he was in the wilderness for 40 days. Now listen, some of the other scriptures don't go, go into but being tempted by Satan. So 40 days he was in there. You know, we think about three, we think about three of the temptations. Well, what did he do the rest of the days? And he was, and it says he, and he was with wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. So don't miss the gospel, don't miss this in the gospels, a 40-day temptation in our minds. We think maybe it was all at once. You know, when we read it, it was like, boom, Satan took him here, Satan took him here, Satan took him here. Well, in our minds, wow, it was only like, what was that, like a couple hours? There was 40 continuous days of temptation. Could you imagine... Can you imagine going through 40 days of, of, of temptation? Yeah. Think about this. Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days. Okay? We know of three temptations that he went through. We know he went through the stones. Remember, he went to the pinnacle. Remember? And he says, hey, I'll make you the king. But all this was already Jesus anyways. But Jesus, remember, 100% man, 100% God, had to come down and experience all the temptations that we would face as human beings. Right? I was never asked to be a king of a nation. I was never asked to make bread into stone. Or bread out of a stone. And I and, and I never was taken to the highest place in the in the area and say, hey, jump off and watch God catch you. So you gotta think about this when you when you go back and, and study this on your own. The 40 days he was there. Know that he was being tempted. Now we think, well, you know, you know, we hear people say, "Well, Satan's really beating the daylights out of me." Well, I don't, I don't think Satan's ever been be beating the daylights out of me. I think there's more important people out there that he's hitting. Now, <laughs> his henchmen are pretty bad as, as to deal with now, but you know, think about this. Jesus had to go through. You know, I think about how we get tempted every day. Jesus had to go through all what we've gone through on a daily basis. To me, it wasn't just those three times. I think it was just three specific things we had to learn. And just remember, though, Jesus, you know, Jesus did it. And he went through it. And we can go to him. Now, Jesus experienced what we would go through so that we can have victory in our lives. Because it says Jesus was tempted in every area. Hebrews 4, verses 15 and 16 says this. You can turn to that, too. Uh, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. So we know that's possible and he did it. Okay, Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That ought to give you comfort. That ought to give you so much peace. You know, even though you couldn't do it, Jesus did it. We rely on him. We rest in the fact that our hearts, my heart was given to Christ. He's my Lord and Savior. And that I could not do it, but he did it. He did it on a cross for you and I. So he came, he also came to model the way of standing up against those temptations. He shows us how to do it. What did he do when, when, when he was with Satan? Hey, listen. He gave him the word of God. When, when a temptation comes to us, what do we do? Do we go to the Word of God, look for Scripture, and we stand on it? Do we ask for the Holy Spirit to help us? What do we do to, to get away from those temptations? And Christ shows us how to be victorious through the Word of God. Christ gives us victory in our lives. He, he's our source. He's where our, we get our, our victory. Amen? Think about it. You know, how often do we go through so many different things in our lives? We know that when we say something stupid sometimes, we go, Oh, Jesus, he never went through this. Oh, yeah, he did. He had to. That's what the 40 days were for. He went through everything. He went through betrayal. He went through separation. He went through hurts and pains. He had agony. 
You know, the things that we face in life, Jesus had faced. Let's go to verse 14. I should say Jesus begins his ministry. He says, now after John had arrest, was arrested, Jesus came into to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, it is time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now we see that Jesus spoke of repentance as well as John the Baptist. He says, listen, people, get your hearts ready. Get your hearts prepared. He says, the time is fulfilled. For what? What's the time is fulfilled? The coming of the Messiah. For the last 30 years, there's been a buzz about the Messiah coming. Remember now. Remember from his birth, being foretold. Remember when he was he was in the manger, and the three wise men, the Magi came. You know, maybe they came and see him, and maybe Herod, Herod wanted to get a hold of him, and there was a buzz. Who's this Messiah? Who's this coming king? Who's this one? You know, and even through his growing up, remember when they had to go back to the temple? Hey, what are you doing? You know, remember he heard a caravan, and he was back teaching, and he said, ah, I was doing about the Father's business. You know, and, and even into his adulthood, remember all the different relationships he had, the friendships he had with people. People were waiting, even through the scriptures and the prophecy of the coming of Messiah. There was a buzz in the land. You know, think about when, when there was something, you know, this is probably not the, the greatest example, but, you know, think about this. The President of the United States is coming to town. He wants to meet everybody. There's a buzz. There's a buzz. When's he coming? When's he coming? Well, he's finally here. And and, and, and thinking, hey, this is what Jesus is saying. The time is fulfilled. I am here. I am here. You just seen me. You just seen me in, 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 in the Jordan. You just seen me come out of the wilderness. And here I am proclaiming repent 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 because he goes on and he goes on and he calls his first disciples he says the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of god is at hand meaning i am here repent and believe in the gospel remember gospel the good news what is the good news the messiah is here and you're about to hear some more and he goes on and he says that jesus calls his first disciples in verse 16 through 20 says this passing along the sea of galilee he saw simon and andrew the brother of simon casting a net into the sea were for they were fishermen and jesus said to them follow me and i will make you or i will be you will become make you become fishers of men and it says immediately they left their nets and followed him it didn't say they took time they took a couple days they thought about it they said immediately they left their nets and followed him and going on a little farther he saw he saw james the son of zebedee john his brother who were on their boats mending their nets and immediately he called to them and he left, they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the higher servants and followed them. Again, immediately is used. It means quick. What's immediately mean? It means right now, right here now, you, they left. Whether they <laughs> rowed their boats in, whether they jumped into the water, swam on the shore, doesn't say. It says immediately he saw them while they left their father Zebedee. Now they must have had some extra money. They must have been wealthy because it says they, they left the father with the hired servants, and they followed Jesus. There was no hesitation uh, came from those men. And, and, you know, let me ask you this then. So if there's no hesitation uh, for them to, to get out of their, their business, they left their business, their families, they left and they said, okay, we're going to follow this guy named Jesus. If Jesus would have challenged you in that same way, would you have gone? You know, I, I can remember when the day when I was working as a carpenter and I had a meeting with some people and they said hey listen we have an opportunity to get into the ministry would you be willing to do that now you get paid because at the time i was working as a, con a construction worker and i would do ministry at night so really i'd be i'd be i kind of was paul sometime when he was tent making i would i would work as a as a, uh, as a carpenter during the day but i would minister in the day and night so you know what i mean uh, my my salary came from um my my hands and working in construction now my salary would come from God, I mean, in a sense, um, from the ministry. And as soon as they asked, and I'm like, you know, I didn't have, I, I was like, I'm there, I'm in. What do I get? Where do I got to sign? Tell me what I got to do. I'm in. And what's amazing, though, is God, when when he offered, when he said, this is what we're going to pay you, it, 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 it matched um, what I was making. Um, with, a, with a little bit of a bonus that I wasn't crushing my body every day, whereas I was a little easier on my body. But 
how many of us would have dropped everything for God? You know, immediately. It says in John 15, verse 16, it says, You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide. And so whatever you ask of the Father in my name, that he may give you. Um, where I wanted to grab, grab that from, it says, You did not choose me, but I chose you. Kind of like when he went and chose the disciples. I'm picking you. Come on, follow me. Follow me. And he chose us. He picked from our hearts to do what? To do his work. So what? So others may hear of the good news, the gospel. It's 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 like this. I'm going to end here for this, for this week. But repentance is, is this. It, it, to put it in the simplest terms that I can understand, hopefully, I mean, others may be listening can understand, because this is really basic. Uh, there's so much more we could get into. But repentance is like this. Drop your old lifestyle. Drop your your own ways of trying and getting into heaven. Your your good works, your 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 way, and follow Jesus. That you we could never ever earn our way into the kingdom of God. We could never have that relationship with God. But we can because of what Christ has done. And Christ came to the earth, and we 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 all know this. To give us all forgiveness of our sins when we ask. To have eternal life. To have a right relationship with God. But the steps we have to take is this. That we have to ask Jesus as Lord and Savior into our hearts. We have to ask, Lord, would you forgive us? Would you live in us? Would you send your Holy Spirit to live in me? That Lord, that, that, Lord, that he would guide us and lead us. And that we would surrender our lives and live for him. And that we, as we were saved, that we would be able to preach the gospel to somebody else that, that would bring somebody else to the saving knowledge of Jesus. Repentance is turning 100%, 180% away from what you used to do and to follow God and follow Him. When those guys dropped their nets, they dropped the fishing business and they followed Jesus. Now we realize later, and you can read probably in John 20, 21, where we know that when Jesus had died, everybody thought that it was over and Peter went back to fishing. Something we need not to do. Don't go back. And that's another subject. But we know that, G that Peter was restored by Jesus at the end because we know in the book of Acts what he did. Repentance is something that's, that's, that's it's a simple thing to do. But it can be also a hard, or a hard thing to do if we're not willing to humble ourselves and admit we need a Savior, that we need Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for tonight. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, as we break in and bust open a little bit of the book of Mark this, this evening, Father, that Lord, that Lord, you showed us why you came, you, that, the, that the prophecies, even in Malachi and Isaiah, were fulfilled in your, in your coming the first time, Lord, as our Savior and Lord. And Father, I pray that even now, Lord, that Lord, you would continually just breathe life into us, Father. I pray, Lord, that our hearts would always be soft and tender, Lord, that there would not be a day, Lord, that we would not be come to you and ask for mercy and grace, that we would ask for forgiveness of our sins, that, Lord, that we would ask and mourn for our sins that we've caused, Father. I ask, Lord, that your grace and mercy would pour out. And Father, but I ask also, Lord, that we don't stay in a state of mourning, but we get into a place of celebration of what you've done and the freedom that you give. That, Lord, that we can have a victorious life through, through you. And I ask, Lord, that you would embolden us and empower us, Father, to go out to our communities, to our neighbors, Lord, and share the gospel with somebody. That the same life, the new life that you gave us, Lord, that, that we, they can have through you and through the power of your Holy Spirit. I thank you for tonight, and I ask, Lord, you would seal it. And, Lord, I ask you to prepare our hearts as we go back over to reread what we just studied, Lord, that you would continually reveal more and more of what you're trying to say. We give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be blessed, and next week, please have verses 21 all the way down to verses 45, I believe. And get ready, and you know what? And write, jot your own note, notes down, and one day we can compare them.
Be blessed and have a great evening. See you now. May the Lord richly bless you.